Hello, my name is Malik Abazda. Welcome to PM Express. They are crisscrossing the country, shouting from shouting themselves hoarse. I'm talking about the politician, and they're making all manner of promises to you. Some of them are questioned whether they are feasible or not. When they are questioned, they say these are feasible. They themselves are counter questioning each other's promises. Do the politicians demonstrate respect for you, the voter, for whose sake they are crisscrossing the country? On today's show, we are discussing the nature of the promises that are being made to you by the politician and whether they have respect for you. When we come back, I will introduce my guest and we will settle for this discussion. Don't go anywhere. You're welcome by you're watching PM Express. You can join this discussion via Facebook, facebook.com forward slash joy news on TV. Or you can send us a message via our WhatsApp message 0, 0560 0560-800,000. You can send us a WhatsApp and then we will share it. My guest for this discussion is none other but our own Mr. Joe Jackson. So Joe Jackson, you're welcome. Good evening. I have never had the honor of meeting you pe in person. Grateful okay. to see you here. Good to see you too. Good to see you. Good to see you. Um, you are a political analyst, and where you said you are a business person as well, you are a financial person, consultant, and all of that. When you hear some of the promises that uh, politicians make, how does that come to you? <laughs> well, <laughs> First of all, the simple answer is that the politicians of today have very little respect for the electorate. There's a cold, hard calculation that the electorate who will analyze things and ask questions and, 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 and ask, are in the minority. And form less than five percent of the of or, or, really? of the population. That's the thinking, and that the average person who is going to vote, who's going to make a difference, needs things to be dumbed down. Is not smart enough, does not understand, and that's evident by the way even the policies are presented, and the way they don't bother to even explain the thinking behind it. Because I tell you, some of the promises that they've made could be presented in a different way and might make a lot more sense. But they are dumbed down into, into uh, uh, what they will call, oh, I'm calling you, i Say it. Let's speak. Uh, literally, it's, 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 it's our equivalent of campaign uh, talk. The, 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 let's take one of the promises, for example, the, I mean the latest one by the MPP's presidential candidate, which is uh, attracting all the headlines. And I'm talking about a dam per district. There was a factory per district. And now it's a dam per village, actually. A dam per village. Uh, yes, a dam for a village. Yeah. When you heard it, how did it come to you? Well, first of all, on the... On the on the surface, it sounds particularly ridiculous. What do you mean by a dam per village? But think about it, right? And that's why I say there's very little respect for the population. I could present the same, form, uh, uh, the same promise in another way that will make us sit at this table and say maybe there is some sense to Do it. that for me. I'll if give you an example. If communicated this Ghana, policy. Ghana lacks food security. Ghana's agri grew by what, 0.04% Since last year. Last year, and there's been marginal growth. Yeah, there's some improvement. Improvement this year. this year. But we're still in trouble. We're importing everything. And that's also partly um, amongst other things because our agri is rain-fed. 
So I could present a policy that says, I'm going to move this country from rain-fed agriculture to, irrigate, to irrigated but in, in all fairness, isn't that a high falutin idea? If you go to my village and you you just dangle this rain fair to irrigation Time reliant. Out. If it's high falutin, then maybe you have to understand why the politician will go to your village and say one dam one one then maybe he's not he's not disrespecting it, he's seeing it as it is. But you see, you, you, we can't have our cake and eat it. We can't I can't say that the people in my village in Senya Breku can only understand it when he says one dam, uh, one village, one dam, and come and sit here and say that, listen, he must have presented it in a way which he makes more sense. Let's take the NDC policy of infrastructure, yeah. right? A lot of people were saying this infrastructure doesn't process, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a method to corruption, etc. and the opposition has been coming at it. But look at it this way. Somebody could present you an argument and say, there's a billion dollar deficit per annum in infrastructure. And the real reason why some countries are ahead of us is because they've built up more infrastructure than we have built up. The building infrastructure lowers the cost of living for all of us. So you've got to go ahead and provide a lot more infrastructure than even we're doing. But that will be deemed high for looting. But, uh, but uh, of course, because if you tell somebody that there is a deficit in infrastructure of a billion Ghana cities or a billion dollars, dollars. I didn't, what, a sorry. billion dollars, yes. it won't mean anything to anyone. But, so, it, but you see, so go and put the road there and flag it. And as a president would do, bring a vulcanizer, evidence-based presentation, bring a vulcanizer and say, this vulcanizer didn't have any better job when we did this road. He now wakes up every morning because cars are plying the road. He's able to fix a few punctures here and there. He's but, making but some money. That's, that's, the way that's to why I say that they don't have, a res they don't have respect for the, for, the, uh, for the electorate because they themselves even when they do the right thing, present it in a populist light. They present it in a populist light because that's what seems to, in their minds, to appeal to the politicians. Look at the last State of Nations address. Yeah. You may sit here and say that it was too frivolous, it was a serious issue. And many disguised it, described it as such. And, and that the president made a joke of everything and some of his evidence-based uh, 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 examples he made and, and, and uh, the references he gave and the, and, and the people who came forward to, 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 to be uh, applauded. Yeah, the Zainab woman were, were, who was keeping pigs and all were, of that. Were ridiculous in the, in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the sight of all the size of our problems and the issues at stake. But he got away with it. He got away with it. So who, who is stupid? Those of us who sit in studios like this and assess the manifestos or promises. Which they haven't given you anyway. Listen, I've spoken on this manifesto issue and I think it is the saddest commentary on the two political parties that we have. Why is that, that they think so little of the electorate, that they think that they don't need an, a, a manifesto to win an election. They don't need to set out their plans to win an election. They don't need to tell us what they want to do for us, but it's enough to mouth empty promises and, 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 and go on a campaign trail and ha hire crowds to follow us and eventually we will vote for them to win. It is sad. But it's the cold, cynical truth. You call it cold, cynical truth. But the president is out there. He's put his agenda before the people. He's asking them, look, I've done a lot of work. Give me a second term and I will do more. And everywhere he has gone, he has shown the people what he has done. He wants an opportunity to do more. The opposition candidate is out there. 
He's telling the people, give me a chance. I will do A, B, and C. And we know some of the promises they've made. He's told us about one district, one factory. He's now telling us about one uh, village, one dam. They're putting out the information out there. <laughs> let, let me be even a bit more cynical. Who knows? There's a scenario that I paint where the MPP, Nana, and uh, Akufuado, and uh, the Dr. Baumia, his running mate, his running mate, are being told by their supporters, this our Dr. Baumia's economic plan may not take us anywhere. Go out there and talk to the people and talk to them. Simplify the message. Say something that the people can understand. And so we, we, stop, the, this, we stop a discussion about the size of the government's uh, fiscal deficit and whether this country is broke or not and all the other issues that for some of us go with the economy and start to even throw even more promises. If he promises f f free education, I promise free education plus. If he promises uh, uh, infrastructure, I say one dam, one village. If he promises this, I promise that plus. And that's where we are getting to. It is a sad, sad, you sad You think it's commentary. absurd? It is. At a certain level, it is. Because you ask yourself, this is a country where, in truth, we are broke. In truth, we are not facing after are reality. We? Oh, we are broke. How can you say you are not broke? When you... I assure you, Mali, that if you spend 70% of your salary paying your domestic servants, right? 70% paying domestic servants and paying for interest on, on money you have borrowed, everybody in this who knows you, the Mali, is broke. When he finishes paying his maid and one other, his driver, then there's, and pays the, the bank for the loans, there's no money left. He I can't pay for help. I thought our debt to GDP ratio has come down. From what percentage to what? From 70 to what? 68? <laughs> that's a serious matter. But that's the problem. For the majority of our people... They don't care. They, uh, that's the point. And the politicians know this, don't they? Yes, but you see, what's the issue at stake? Both sides of the political divide have decided in a cold and cynical way that there's no real point in telling in fighting the, prop, the, the, the biggest battles in front of the Ghanaian, that they will still vote on who is more handsome. They will still vote on who is going to give me uh, 10 cities, who will, vote, who will give me a torchlight. And they will still vote on all those issues, who is taller. And so as far as they're concerned, this is, this is what we must do. And this is how we must play it. And who has swag? Who has swag. Or who is going to give them... Uh, uh, 10 CDs on election day. Do you see a dangerous deviation from the germane issues to, for want of a better expression, to the uh, non-serious issues or to... Populist issues, that's what I'll call them. There is a steady move away to from... To the mundane, that's the expression I was yes, looking for, to the mundane issues. To issue. the populist mundane issues. That even when there is a serious thought, be, there's, there are some serious thinking and serious thought behind a policy, it has to be broken down and dumped down so that it's presented in a way in which the so-called electorate, and I say so-called electorate, who, are, who don't know what they're about, Will understand. But is that not a function of development that if you want to lead, you must communicate in a language that the people understand? And if you have a policy for the people, you must break it down in a language that they understand and appreciate, in order that they can buy into it. I think that's what the politicians are just learning to do. Uh, well, you could say that, but I don't agree. And I think what we are suffering is from two policies. We're, we're playing up to two political parties who have both decided that we're stupid. And then none of them wants to break away, break that mold and face reality. 
all of them assume that we are, we are a bit stupid and that we won't understand. And those of us who are making noise on the radio stations, when push comes to shove, it does not matter. And, and you sound pretty upset when you are talking about the failure of the two, political, the two leading political parties, i.e. The, the NDC and the MPP, to present to us what their manifestos are. Um, both parties have consistently postponed the day for outdooring their manifesto. The Nanado's encounter with the IEA, the evening encounter with the IEA, hasn't come off. It's been postponed twice, primarily because the manifesto is not out. And I remember the communications director of the party, Nana Komiya, explaining to us that the reason why they went for a second postponement was that their manifesto was not ready. They were tightening a few uh, knots here and there. So it is still not out. The NDC, after their campaign launch in Cape Coast, gave us a date for the launch of their manifesto. That too has been postponed. You see, the manifesto in particular upsets me. It makes me feel that they are not ready to even stand up and be counted upon the premises they make. That I have reason to believe when, when, when cynical members of the public tell us that the politicians themselves are shocked at how well we believe their promises, which they <laughs> really are empty. They said, there's somebody told a joke. He said, listen, when I said it, even me, I didn't believe it. How can you believe it? <laughs> <laughs> even he, the one making the promise, he, he didn't, the one believe making the promise didn't believe it. How can you are believing it? Are we gullible? And is the voter gullible? You know... In a sense, I would And I'll be going on to the phone line to talk to a voter. I, I don't think the voters are gullible. I don't think the voters are stupid. I think that the Ghanaian public are very intelligent and they know what they're doing. Are we? I think <laughs> that what has happened is that there is a conspiracy of the ruling elite to dumb down things. Just a very harsh word. Conspiracy of the ruling elite. Let me go on to the phone lines and talk to Agana Siri Agana. He is a voter. Um, Siri, welcome to PM Express. Okay, we don't appear to have him now. He will be joining us. He's a voter. Uh, he will be joining us to uh, be more than keen to hear from him whether he shares your frustrations about the politicians conspiring to dumb things on us. Yes. Why is the electorate not actively demanding the manifestos? I'm sure if the active, if the if you demanded it, it probably would have been provided. You see, here's the challenge you have. When you have been so beaten and, uh, and beaten down by life and all the other issues, right? Ooh, who needs a uh, The truth of the matter is that a lot of them who would analyze it and go through it just cannot raise the energy to go and ask and have lowered expectations of what the politicians will do. That's where we are. That's where we are. And I say that where we are is the fault of both sides of the divide. That is the fault of the people. Because if the people demanded it, they would provide it. The people are, at this moment, asleep to what the uh, 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 ruling elite then is. That's their problem. Because if, if you vote people, people are looking for your vote. Nobody will be president unless the person is voted for. Uh -huh. President Mahama would not be president if he was not voted for. So all the other persons who are contesting in these elections, all of them can't be what they are unless they are voted for. In fact, Nede Kufado would not be a flag bearer of a party if he was not voted for. Okay. Why is it that the people we vote for or will vote for are the people who then conspire to shove things down our throats? Because we have no option. Nobody on that ballot paper is worth voting for. All of them haven't released their manifestos. How many of them have filed their tax returns? The president has filed his a couple of times. I don't know whether he is, he's up to date, but I know that the president has consistently been filing his tax. What about all the other politicians? And, and, and that's when, when he sells copies of his books because by the constitution he does not pay tax. But you see, here's my issue, right? Both sides of the divide don't care. And under the guise of what plagiarism, they say I won't release it because if I release it, you 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 copy from me. 
I won't release it. That's, that's, that's awful. It's, are we, the public, so stupid that we cannot tell who came up with the idea first? Oh, no. It's a, and I repeat it. It's the conspiracy of the political elite to keep the downtrodden where they are. What can the voters do? What should the voters do? You are saying none of the people who will be on the ballots have been proven that they are worth voting for. Because four months of the election, we don't know what they are, the specifics of nobody, plans Nobody are. has told us anything. They've given you indications. Do you oh. know that Nanado will build dams and create Factors. irrigable land and build factories. We know that the president will give us uh, a first class hospital in each, each district and he's doing that. He's promised to provide uh, competent leadership and build on the foundation that he laid in the last four years. Um, there are those who question what happened in the four years before the last four years, why the foundation wasn't laid and, and all of that. Yeah. But they've told us the things they would do. Listen, when you don't have a manifesto, it's impossible to look at a holistic approach. A manifesto is a holistic look at what you say you would do. For me to pass, on ju pass judgment on you and say, your ideas are good or your ideas are chaff. So when you refuse to give me your manifesto, my assumption is that maybe you don't want me assessing you. Okay, I want us to take a break. When we come back, what's, what are these manifestos? Do manifestos win elections? Have they proven to be decisive in previous elections? If not, what's the first? We will come back from this break. We are watching Perm Express and we are discussing political promises and the manner in which the politician treats the electorate. Do they treat you with respect? My guest is Mr. Joe Jackson, a political analyst, a financial consultant. He wears many hats. When the politicians talk about each other, i.e. when the MPP are talking about the NDC and when the NDC are talking about the MPP, do you sense that they do not show sufficient respect for each other? Oh, of course, they don't have any respect for each other. Why is that? Because, you know, it, it, it's, there's a certain legacy that we've all come to accept and hold on of political, backhanded political insults being thrown left, right, and back and forth. And that's the problem. That's the problem. It's, 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 it's such that uh, politicians have no respect for each other. Maybe because they know who each other is. Maybe because they hang out in parliament together. Maybe they know themselves that they are not worthy. Because they are always accusing each other anyway. The NDC is accusing the MPP and vice versa. Yes. Yes. And, and, and our rather usually quiet vice president, Park Wissin Emizat Arthur, today was reported as saying, telling party supporters in the central region, his home region, by the way, that henceforth, the NDC will not tolerate the MPP's um, provocations. There was a debate whether he used insults or provocations. Mm -hmm. Whatever it is, he says the NDC will no longer tolerate the MPP's provocations, and that if the MPP provoke them, they will provoke twice back. <laughs> but you see... All that has happened is again, people have gone to the vice president and say, you talk, oh, if you don't talk, if you keep quiet, we'll drop you or whatever, something to that, to that effect. But listen, the electorate are not stupid. They just don't have credible options. The electorate are not stupid. They just don't have credible options. No, they don't. Really? Somebody sent me a message, and this person hasn't told me his name. He said, Malik, why dwell on MPP and NDC alone? PPP, PNC, and Co are there. So there are alternatives. 
We have the PPP, you have PNC, you have CPP. Um, so there are alternatives. Yes. What are the chances of winning? That's the point. If you don't what vote for them... What are the chances of winning? You have to vote before they can win. But have they presented themselves in a manner which makes me feel that if I gave them my vote, they would win? There are those who believe that Pakwes Indum and his PPP have done well for themselves. Well, more than anybody else, I have a lot of respect for Pakwes Indum. And I actually believe that he maybe should give up politics and, and stick to his business because he's a very... Very, very successful business. So why not give him an opportunity and see whether he can replicate what he's doing in governance? Oh, but he can get that opportunity. Except I'm not sure he'll get any opportunity in, in the government to shine and, and to implement his, his idea of what this... So, so the problem is you, the electric. And, and let me go to the phone and talk to um, my, br my brother and friend, Agana. Um, if you can hear me, welcome to PM Express. Thank you so much. Good. Um, Good evening. Yes. We are discussing the, kind, the nature of promises that the politicians are making to you, you the voter, and the manner in which they talk to you. The question we are asking, do the politicians demonstrate sufficient respect for you, the voter? Should they, in any case? Should they show you any respect? Why should they? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for the question. Um, I should say for the two questions, should they show respect and, um, and do they? Well, as a common citizen who is thinking about the best interests of my country and, um, and the best interests of my own personal participation as a citizen, I think, and I've said before, a lot of the time the promises that politicians tend to make um, do not take into consideration the particular needs, the very specific needs of myself as an individual citizen. I hear a lot of promises that, for example, are very general, um, rather generic, um, and without going into too many specifics, I think I personally have not been convinced by a lot of the ones that I have heard. You do um, not think that any of the promises target you? I, I do think, however, um, I do think that it's not a deliberate attempt by politicians per se to disrespect um, the intelligence of citizenry. It is probably just the lack of a more deliberate effort to try and actually find out from citizenry what promises they want to hear. So in that regard, I do not necessarily feel insulted. Um, I, I, I don't necessarily feel that my intelligence has been insulted, um, but I don't feel either as if my specific needs are identified with in the promises that I hear. Um, uh, my uh, guest in the studio, Mr. Joe Jackson, was raising questions about why up until this point, the two major parties, the NPP mm, and the yes. NDC, yes. having put out their manifestos, Manifesto. detailing exactly what they would do if mm. they are given the mandate. How much of that well, is a problem for you? Honestly speaking, there is one hand on which I can see why they've been a little reluctant. Um, and I doubt that either um, party would own to this, but I think learning from the experience of previous elections, people may be trying to be a little bit um, more prudent this time, more careful and measured. They may be doing a little bit more homework. So, it may be taking them a little more time, but at the same time, it is late in the day, is it? Um, I would think that by this time, we should all have a good sense of what each political party in this race feels they can bring to the table and offer the citizenry. Um, if the two major political parties are still delaying on that, then either my first theory is correct and they are just trying to be more diligent in their, in their homework, or there probably isn't that much of a clue on either side, what it is we actually need, which again feeds into my earlier concern that our politicians sometimes don't seem to be very, very much in touch with us. A lot of the rhetoric is on the very high generic level, you know, what, what they think we need around education, what they think we need around energy, and things like that. 
but there's not a ring that guarantees or gives me a sense of guarantee that they are in touch with my specific needs and the specific needs of um, people, other people that I speak with. There are those who feel that if a party cannot give you a manifesto four months to election, mm. why is the guarantee that if this party were to win elections or to retain power in the case of the governing party, yeah. that within the four years they can do that which they tell you they will do? Remind you also that the evidence have shown that uh, quite unfortunately, they have not been able to fulfill their promises. This morning, uh, Dr. Yeah. Owusu Akuto was saying that if they promise to build a dam in every district and they do half of it, mm -hmm. that is good enough. Uh, the president yeah. promised to build 200 community day schools in the 2012 elections. They themselves now say that only 123 yeah. of them we're giving yeah. out so far only nine or so have been commissioned. Yeah. So far, they, don't, they haven't proven that they can fulfill their promises. So if they can't give you a manifesto, where is the evidence that they can fulfill the promises that they make to you? Yeah, um, you, you, can, you can look at it on, on that level. Um, theoretically speaking, yes, if you're formed to an election and you, you can't even be told what the plan is going forward after the election, then you have to question everything. You have to question whether... Um, the politician has an agenda. You have to question whether he trusts his agenda. You have to question whether he trusts his own competence in delivering on what he thinks you need. Um, but then again, I, I also want to look at this on the backdrop of the past. Um, whether we like it or not, politicians have failed to deliver on promises with manifestos in the past, haven't they? Yeah. You see, um, in the past, they've, they've, they have come out with very um, cogent and comprehensive you know, manifestos and have still failed to deliver on promises. So personally, I'm not gauging the likely success of the future on, in terms of how well they are going to fulfill, yes, on, on, on the presence or absence of the manifesto. Yeah. I do think it's a worrying sign, and at a minimum, we do need to start getting to hear um, some of these concrete steps. What the manifesto allows us to do as citizens is to assess and critique on an objective level um, what, what hitherto would have been simply rhetorical promises made on the campaign platforms, right? Okay. The manifesto allows us to sit down you know, and think through methodically what the politicians have planned for us. L that is a right that we have, which Please? I think we should be yes, allowed to exercise. Please hold the line for me. Let me come back into the studio and talk to Mr. Jackson on this. Sure. Um, he is suggesting that he has two, one of two theories. It may be the case that they are just taking time because they want to be diligent and they want to give you a comprehensive, properly packaged, uh, properly cost manifesto, or um, some other reason may account for the reason why they are not giving you the manifesto. Maybe they are just trying to be diligent. Huh. The, what are the chances that it's just a little case of being diligent. Or, and what are the chances that the manifesto is, was the last thing on their minds? And that as you grow closer to the election, it's a document you put forward to fulfill all righteousness. And then after that, it's thrown into the dustbin and life goes on. We don't have a manifesto. We don't have any way to judge them. And uh, my, uh, my, the only thing I can think of is that they didn't start working on the manifesto early enough. But or they don't think it matters. Because the parties contesting this election knew four years ago that they will contest it. How, how, let's take NPP. How long since they elected a flag bearer? Because they elected their flag bearer somewhere in October 2014. Thank if you. I remember Two correctly. years ago. And if at this time they haven't produced uh, a manifesto, you tell me it's because of what they are being far more diligent. Because look at look but, and look at the NDC. They put out documents about how they've been performing, etc. There's a green book. There's a green book. There's the report on the uh, accountability. 
roadshow and so on and so forth. Why isn't there a manifesto? Because the general secretary of the party tells us, I mean, they are in office. They are not in a hurry to put out a manifesto because well, the things that well, they say... At, at least it's me. Why, <clears throat> why are they in a hurry? Because they don't think a manifesto will make a difference in their election. And That's Agana, what he's saying. Uh, um, he says essentially you don't matter. My, my, my brother Agana shares that because he says even if they were to put out a manifesto, a properly done manifesto, there's still no guarantee that they would fulfill all the promises contained in the manifesto. I'll put it this way. The manifest, manifestos are documents that they write to fulfill all right, uh, righteousness. They don't intend to keep to them. They will not keep to them. And as soon as they are written, they are, written, they are thrown away somewhere in the dustbin. That's what you think they are doing. Where is the manifesto of last year's e e election? Let me, let me bounce off your, your theory about the conspiracy to dump things on, 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 on the voter of, of Agana. If you can hear me, uh, Mr. Yeah. Joe Jackson is he's of the view that, look, the politicians have conspired to dump things on the voter. And you are saying that you have not been convinced. He shared that view partly because he says, mm. in his opinion, the politicians are learning to communicate to only a section of the society. He mm. says, for people like himself and you who live in the cities, who are worried about interest rates, about cost of yeah. living, about level of borrowing, debt to GDP ratio, and all of those mm -hmm. highfalutin ideas, the politicians know that you don't determine the vote. It's the people from my village who determine the vote. So it is those people that they will communicate to and they will tell them very banal things, if you like. Yeah. Well, I think you, 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 have, to, you have to admit, if, if we are four months um, to the elections and the manifestos are not here, then clearly the political parties have thought they can afford this, right? They can afford to be, two, uh, to be four months to a general election and not have presented manifestos to the people. Now, if they think they can afford that, then yes, there is a sense in which they are taking, you know, at least a section of the electorate for granted. Um, they, they are certainly focusing, I believe, strongly as well on a constituency of the electorates that are probably not as bent on seeing these documents as some of us are. They're not as sophisticated as you. <laughs> probably. Um, I, I personally recall from the last um, general elections a certain sentiment expressed that, you know, people could say all they wanted on social media, and we, we thought we were a, a large elite force of Ghanaians on social media, but the, the, so the voice didn't really amount to much. And, you know, the smart politician knew where to campaign, he knew where to focus, and it wasn't on social media. Of course, in that particular narrative, social media was just used as a, a metonymy for, you know, this informed class you are talking about, people who live in the city and are concerned about these so-called uh, highfalutin ideas. But I can certainly identify with that sentiment. Like I said, there can only be one reason why uh, this late in, we still don't have such important documents. And for whatever else could explain it, whether they are doing their due diligence, like I myself have suggested, or anything else, if any political party feels that at this point, they can afford to not have submitted them. Then we have to ask whether they think it really matters at all. Do they, I think that is a legitimate sentence. Do, do, do the electorate have the politician they deserve? Please ask that again. The electorate, do we have the politicians we deserve? Do we have the politicians we deserve? I, I, I tend to think so. You know, we've discussed this before. And... Um, I have said, for example, that there is a, there is a constituency of very highly concerned Ghanaians who, um, in that discussion, we're talking about floating voters. Yes, you know, we're talking I about, I remember you and I were talking about floating yes, voters. Yeah. A lot of people float forever and just never settle down. They never really vote, mm -hmm. right? Um, and it's not because they are apathetic, but they feel that the status quo um, is not what Ghana deserves. They feel that um, 
the spectrum of options available to the country are not convincing and that Ghana can, can have more. And their abstinence is actually sort of a protest, you know, if you, if you take it so. Their abstinence is sort of saying, look, none of you cut it. Um, we, are, we are looking to see something better. Which is now, working in the not... favor, which is working in the favor of some, some of the yes, politicians. Yes, exactly. So I'll just come to that. You may, you, you may or may not think that's the right way to go. And, and there are, you know, legitimate arguments against that approach. But I'm only bringing that up to make the point that for a large section of Ghanaians, I do think it's true that we are not critical enough about the political status quo, about the range of options that we have. Um, and so election in, election out, we send the statement that either party A or party B is enough, right? And we'll go out in our numbers and at least 80% of us will vote across these two parties. And the statement that it makes generally is that we are satisfied with this status quo, right? We are satisfied with, you know, either NPP or NDC. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. In that sense, if anybody accuses us of deserving this status quo, deserving this range of political options available to us, I would say that's, a, that's an accusation um, that's very legit. And, and those who said that you, those of you, the chattering masses who were sitting on social media and thinking that you know it yeah. all, in, yeah. the, in, in, in the end, they tend to be proven right because they focus on... The, 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 the poor farmer in the village who needs a bag of fertilizer or even a bowl of fertilizer, they can put a bag of fertilizer in the house and then share, share it by bowls to everyone. They are the people who determine who gets elected. Well, um, to an extent that's true. Um, all I'd say is it assumes something which I think is both sinister and untrue. And this is what it assumes, that all these... Um, you know, so-called elites in, in cities have only their interests at heart, that when they assess um, and analyze political issues in order to make a vote, they are only voting for themselves and their privileged class. Um, I think that's a sinister assumption to make. A lot of those people who made a lot of noise on social media were making this noise on the behalf of those farmers who do need fertilizers in the villages. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. so we're making those noises on behalf of marginalized societies who do need certain interventions. Making those those, those noises on behalf of school children who still, you know, go to school under very impoverished conditions and have to go home when it rains. So I personally don't entertain that notion for... So why is it that the politicians to, can dismiss you with a wave of a hand? Because ultimately the objective is the vote. Ultimately the end, not the means, but in my opinion for many politicians... The end is the vote, not the desired outcome that, that the vote that the voter thinks the vote is going to lead to. You understand? Yeah. So if if your end goal is to be voted into power, then of course your focus is going to be, you know, on the shortest route to that, the line of least convenience. And often that will be um, going and speaking directly to to um, somebody whom you probably don't have to engage with on as complex and as detailed terms, you know, as the, the, the guy on, on social media who is making all his noise about macroeconomic indices, you know. So I think it's just a matter of political expediency that um, this section of the, the political voice is ignored, um, or if not ignored, definitely not given as much attention as it should be. But I do think that will change over time, you know, as more people get educated and access to, you know, all these media improves and increases, that voice will grow louder, it will grow more significant, and it will become more and more difficult for politicians. On, on that note of optimism, I think we have to bring this discussion to a close for you. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, thank you. Thank you. I, I, I hope that next time you, you can be with us in the studio, you were able to be with so us, too. but I the notice so came too. quite Indeed. late. Thank you nonetheless. Thank you too so much. God bless. Thank you. Um, so he says... For those of us sitting in Accra, and you were talking about sitting in the studio and some are sitting on social media and they are saying all kinds of things, the politicians can ignore you. And they have proven to do that. And it hasn't affected their fortunes. You see, in a sense, that's right. 
they've won elections have been won without addressing the issues of the of the of the small of the vocal minority as they like to think that the, it's the media that makes a lot of of noise and it's those uh, commentators and Serial callers and co. And, and, and in fact, they say they say, "Oh, they are moody, go and sit in a cry and make your noise and make your noise." And they say it. They're yes. actually arrogant enough to say it. Yes. But the question we must ourselves ask ourselves is that: Why do our electorate have such a low expectation of the politicians? That's a fundamental mm. question. I want us to take a break, a last break. If we come back, when we come back, we will continue with this discussion. I have tons and tons of messages. I will be reading them, and I'll be going back to Mr. Jackson for his responses. You're watching PM Expression. We are talking about politics. Don't go anywhere. watching PM Express and we are talking politics and the way the politician treats you the voter these are some of your messages let me read them this one says uh, Malik this is such a long message Malik what don't what didn't Akufa do promise in the run-up to the to both the 2008 and 2012 elections despite all he did he still lost the elections Ghanaians are so discerning so can't be quite uh, coy by those phantom promises. Mustafa Hamid, who speaks for Akufado, gave different interpretations on this one village, one damn promise. The retirement of, of Akufado cannot be averted and definitely not negotiable. This is Barima Kubaji, Jini Jini. And uh, the other day I said this is a serial texter because almost every day he sends a text. This one is Michael Amenin, UK. Hi, Malik. President Mahama had committed political suicide by this decision in releasing Mugabe and co. from prison. And, uh, and the Ghanaian floating voter is going to consider this irresponsible and reckless decision by President Mahama and vote against him. That's your opinion. President Mahama and his government do not have anything positive to tell Ghanaians floating voter to appeal for them to vote. Majority of Ghanaians are calling for a change. And nothing can prevent this inevitable wind of change blowing over Ghana abroad. I don't know whether the votes abroad. Rupa has not been allowed, so uh, unless you come home to come and vote. Uh, this one says, this is, uh, the elite is interested in manifesto, but majority of the rural folk are not interested in manifestos. They have made their mind who to vote for. Again, if these two major political parties have about 5, 000, 5 million voters each, what will they, voters, need manifestos for? If elite needs manifesto to critique, these party faithful and rural folk would not critique any manifesto at all. This is Jakarta, USA. Uh, uh, somebody's interfering with my... This one, this one. Hi, Malik. My name is my name is Wanda. All these politicians are the same. None of them cares for us. They are all self-serving. Who is calling? They are all uh, self-centered. Big promises in order to get elected. Big excuses in order to rule. As Bob Marley said, they always keep us hungry with their political strategy. And when uh, when you want to get some food, or brother got to be your enemy, Allah save us and bless Ghana. The person doesn't tell us who he is and where he's sending us this from. This is Akutu Razak, Tamali. Uh, when politicians need power, they make all kinds of promises. This is what Akutu is saying. Um, Mr. Jackson is not convinced by the nature of their promises. Yeah, but a lot, a lot, a lot of people have sent messages to us. Um, we don't have too much time left. What the, can the politicians do? Is it 
perilous. Is it a perilous journey for the politician to continue to ignore you, the chattering masses sitting in, in the cities? You see, here's the challenge that the politicians, and that's why I say it's a cold, cynical calculation. If the chattering, those making noises, can make a connection with those listening better than you can do as a politician, then you've lost the calculation. But if you still believe that you can connect to these voters and that your promises are all that is required, fine. Because they don't need you anyway to win, do they? Well, they don't need us. Because they have boxed all of you and they know where you will vote, so they don't yes. target you, they target other people. Possible. But they target people for whom... I asked you a question just before we went on break, and I said, why is it that the Ghanaian electorate has such a low expectation of our politicians? Because the politicians deliberately keep the expectations so low. Good. So why are we, so why are we not discussing the fact that politicians on both sides of the divide have, are in a conspiracy not to do what they have to do. Because if you don't have because water, and they give you, if you don't have water, you are sharing water with cows, and they give you a borehole, you have to clap for that. Exactly. It's, 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 a, it's, 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 it's both sides of the divide. And it's a sad, sad commentary on the, on, on the political class. What should they do? What should they do? Because they can't please people like you. You no. are far too first sophisticated. Your expectations are unattainable. No, There's absolutely not nothing they that's can not do true. for you. So that's they will target true. the people what, who appreciate what, the little things. What, what, I'm, what we are looking for. Give them a damn. What we are looking for is one, one uh, for the first set of politicians who will tell us the truth. Who will actually tell us the truth of what is happening in this country. Not play politics. But do you want the truth? Why not? Because when you tell the people the truth, you scare them. So let you have to let, give them let, hope. Let me give you an example of where we both sit, right? And the sad, sad part about where we sit. This country is broke. The government would entirely disagree with you. Well, that's, it's, 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 their, it's their privilege and, and their right to disagree. But when you study the numbers and we, we use 70% of our, of our earnings to pay uh, uh, debt service and, and recurring bills, mainly yes. single spine. Interest rate payments and salaries. Finish. You are broke. So I don't care what you say about it. It may be terminology, it may be, but it's all semantics. Finance Minister Setekwe has told us the government has significantly reduced borrowing. In fact, he says the government should be credited with the slowest rate of borrowing after HIPIC. Guess what? I do agree that in the first half of this year, our finance minister did quite well. The question is, why are you throwing away all the good things you did in the second half? Why is it that you've done so well in the beginning of this year and then all of a sudden, now you're playing to the gallery. Yeah, but the last time they went to take the euro bond, it was not subscribed. So but that was not borrowed. because that was not because he refused to take the euro bond. It was because the rate at which the euro bond, uh, those who were prepared to give him money, was so high that he, 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 he virtually said, I won't give you money. Because if you come to me and you say you want to borrow, and I say, okay, I'll take 30% per month, you say, oh, this man, Mr. Jackson, doesn't want to give me the money. Oh. If he wants to give it to me, why is it, well, how am I going to find 30% per month? Likewise, if you go as a nation and you get the rates that uh, 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 we got as a nation, then they are telling you that we don't want to lend to you, that you are junk status. I'm saying, under horrendous pressures, the Honorable Minister of Finance did well. Don't throw it away. But is it fair to expect the politician to come and tell you that we are broke?
when the same politician is asking for your vote. When he doesn't tell me the truth, let me tell you what happens. Then you get agitation. Today is Closac. Tomorrow is pharmacists. The next day is uh, it's uh, 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 lecturers and university workers, and they're saying that oh, the 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 the, the, the conditions in the... listen, we are broke. That sounds alarmist. It's not alarmist. Do we have money? Anyway. That's, that's where we have to end this. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. It's Jackson. a pleasure. It's a what real pleasure. We <laughs> should you. continue this discussion. Uh, we should. We should. So thank you, Mr. Joe Jackson. Joe Jackson is a, he's a political analyst, but he's also a financial consultant. Uh, he's been helping us out understand whether the Ghanaian voter is being disrespected by the politician, by the manner in which the politicians treat the voter. God willing, tomorrow we will bring you another exciting discussion on PM Express. Until then, my name is Malik Abbas Dabu. Bye-bye.